Hello everybody and welcome to this uh, talk today. My name is Russell Clegg. I'm the learning officer for the Patrick Geddes Centre situated at Riddles Court. And we're coming to you today from the Geddes Room in Riddles Court. Um, Riddles Court is managed by the Scottish Historic Buildings Trust, which is a national charity dedicated to saving redundant and neglected buildings and transforming them for new purposes and uses. And you can see from this first slide here, some of the buildings that SHBT has transformed over its 35 year history. And some of these buildings were at a serious state of dereliction. Nobody else wanted to touch these buildings and SHBT took them on. And at the end of the show, you'll see uh, these transformed buildings at the end slide. So if you'd like to find out more about the Trust's work, please do visit the website at www.shbt.org.uk. And if you've enjoyed the talk today and you'd like to support the Trust in some way, we'd love you to make a donation to help our future work. Well, today's talk will be on the subject of Patrick Geddes, the scientist, sociologist, environmentalist, and town planner. And the focus of today's presentation is Geddes' work in Edinburgh during the 1880s and 1890s. Now, with the Patrick Geddes Centre being situated at Riddles Court, SHBT have created an authentic link to Geddes and his field of action in Edinburgh's old town. The talk today is entitled Patrick Geddes in Edinburgh, Addressing Challenges and Creating Change. And the presentation will focus on Geddes' approaches to civic and cultural improvements in the late 19th century Edinburgh old town. So the problems that he came across and the interventions that he made to create purposeful change. And throughout this presentation, I will show you primary evidence which gives you real insight into Geddes as a man of action. And we start with this handwritten letter uh, from Patrick Geddes to his grandsons in the 1920s. And Geddes was actually based in India at the time, and he's writing back to his grandsons who are living in uh, Britain. And he says, but don't suppose the wonderful is only the far away. Edinburgh and its outlooks are wonderful to get you the habit of wonder over all that's to be seen. That's the magic of science, all the sciences, and of art too, all the arts. I'm sure you're learning, as I did at your age, and Mummy and Arthur too, uh, the wonder of the, the beauty feasts. So tell me about yours when you write to grandpa. And basically this is Geddes sharing his outlook on life um, uh, with his grandsons. It reveals Geddes' beliefs about how place and an outlook is key to understanding your civic role. This outlook is also reflected in his ideas about interdisciplinary approaches to education that the sciences and the arts are subjects which should be seen holistically rather than single discipline areas of learning. So this first timeline of Geddes in the 1880s uh, shows us how he sought um, a role for himself in Edinburgh when he returned to Edinburgh. The circles that he moved in and the civic action that he took to establish himself as part of the old town community. And you can see there that he, he seeks posts um, as a demonstrator of botany in the Royal Botanic Garden. But one of the key things um, happens in 1884 there, where he becomes a founder member of an organization called the Edinburgh Social Union. And the Social Union is very much interested in housing, how people live, how workers live, and in culture, how we can make um, a, a better town to live in. So um, here's a, a young Patrick Geddes um, in, in the first picture there, aged about 27. And then here he is with um, his wife, 
Anna Morton and his daughter Nora. So following his marriage to uh, Anna, the couple actually quit their comfortable flat in Princess Street and relocated to number six James Court, which was a slum enclave in the old town. Now this was quite um, um, a dramatic thing for a middle-class couple to do. And both he and Anna set about making small improvements to their home, adding window boxes for flowers, lime washing the internal stair to make it more hygienic, and demonstrating by practical means to their neighbours the benefits that these small improvements could make to the close and the courtyard as a whole. And their daughter, Nora, who was born in James's court in 1887, describes the Geddes' activities in this unpublished memoir. Uh, this is a draft of her unpublished memoir here that she wrote in the 1960s. And she says, he believed in the value of interchange between classes of the student and the laborer, the professor and the craftsman. He began in small ways to do jobs of cleaning up and color washing, window boxes, himself taking part, clad in a nightshirt as overall. He persuaded Mrs. Phoebe Traquair um, to execute a mural for the mortuary of the Children's Hospital. Now, this uh, uh, evidence here, this insight from a witness um, uh, to the Geddes family just shows you the kind of character that Patrick Geddes was. He was a real agent of change. And it also says something about his personality in that he's able to get the support of craftspeople, of artists like Phoebe Anna Traquair, one of the great um, artists of the arts and crafts movement in Scotland. Um, uh, through the Edinburgh Social Union, Traquair was commissioned to create this mural for the, uh, uh, the chapel in the Sick Kids Hospital, which is still there today. So these photographs of Edinburgh's old town taken in the late 1860s by Archibald Burns show exactly the type of community that Geddes had relocated to with all its ills of overcrowding, uh, poverty and disease. And the improvements that were made in the 1870s under the Chambers scheme, uh, clearing the slum housing, did not actually solve the problems around uh, poverty and hardship. It just shifted them elsewhere. And meanwhile, the improving influence of the upper and middle classes was lost as they moved to outlying districts uh, with more spacious residences. So this is the kind of community that Patrick Geddes and Anna Morton were, were living in, um, in the 1880s. And again, Nora describes this in her memoir. Um, she talks about how on the top floor, so this is halfway down this extract, on the top floor with the Tinker families, it was impossible for the others to associate with. Such was the dirt and vermin of their homes. And then she talks about how uh, you know, at the time of her writing, conditions have changed, but at the time that Geddes was living there, decent folk lived there too and appreciated the presence of Mr. and Mistress Geddes. Now, around the same time that Geddes relocates to the old town, an international exhibition takes place in 1886 on Edinburgh's meadows. And this included a full-scale reproduction of the 17th century Old Town buildings. And interestingly, this exhibition was mounted some 20 years after the Chamber's improvements had seen wide-scale demolition of the kinds of buildings displayed in these photographs. And you can see here, this would have been an absolute spectacle if you'd been to this um, uh, um, international exhibition. Here we have a full-scale replica of the Netherbow Gate and the Merkur Cross. And you can see people uh, dressed up in 17th century costume, interpreting this facsimile world around them. And it's really quite possible 
that Patrick Geddes himself attended this exhibition and saw the value of these historic buildings. And this may well have influenced Geddes' own attitudes to the conservation and retention of the uh, Old Town's remaining historic sites, including this one, Riddle's Court. So moving into the 1890s, uh, this is a decade which sees prolific activity and project initiation by Patrick Geddes. So his ideas around improvement, education and culture begin to come together and this begins with his project to bring a middle class element back to the old town in the form of students. And he does this by acquiring a series of buildings and turning them into undergraduate student halls. So in 1890, Riddle's Court itself was the venue for one of these halls. And in the same decade, as you can see from this timeline, he acquires other properties within the locus of Riddle's Court to expand his field of action. So in, in 1893, he is invited by the town corporation to conduct a series of improvement schemes, opening out the slum closes and courtyards with his conservative surgery approach. So this is why Riddle's Court and other buildings of its type survived in this era. Geddes identified their material and cultural worth an approach that SHBT have echoed during its renovation of Riddle's Court. And in these images here, we can see the changes Geddes made. Um, so in this first uh, picture, the sketch, you can see this kind of projecting four tenement coming out beyond the archway. Well, Geddes removes that um, and it, 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 he puts in this external stair that you can see in the last picture there. So he's letting in more light into the, uh, into the courtyard, he's making it more open, it becomes a more salutary place to live, um, and the conditions are improved overall. And notice in the middle picture there above the, the archway, the plaque which uh, denotes the University Hall at Riddle's Court. And again, Nora describes Riddle's Court um, in her memoir. She talks about how the, it's, there's a little inner courtyard, hard and colour washed, and then up a winding stair to study bedrooms and great common rooms, one with a 17th century painted ceiling and one a patterned ceiling in plaster work. Uh, the windows looked out towards the Pentland Hills and she talks about um, um, Victoria Street below. And actually, this is a view that I can still see today sitting, looking out of the, of the, the windows of the Geddes Room. And these are some of the legacies of the student hall at Riddle's Court. And you can see um, here a journal written by one of the students, one of the undergraduate students residing at Riddle's Court during the 1891 and 1892 terms. And you can see some of the things that they got up to. There's a little um, pencil sketch there of uh, this, the, the students having uh, a dance, which could have taken place in the room that I'm sitting in right now. That's the kind of exciting thing about the, this building. You get the frisson and echoes of the past all around you. And there's one of the students uh, 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 playing a practical joke. Uh, what he's doing is he's scaled the walls of the inner courtyard and he's put a bust of Socrates in the niche just below the pediment there. And you can still see that pediment, that niche and those stylized thistles there if you visit Riddle's Court today. Sadly, the, the bust of Socrates is long gone. Also, we have a, a detail here from the famous uh, painted heraldic ceiling, which I'm sitting under right now. Um, which uh, Geddes commissioned for Riddle's Court in 1897. It tells the story of the building, it, it's, its place within the city of Edinburgh and its association with the university. It's a very fine piece of artwork. And other legacies from the University Hall period that echo Patrick Geddes' approach to, to, to learning. 
uh, this fine um, arts and crafts stained glass window, which is in the reception of the building, showing these three doves here. The doves represent uh, sympathy, synergy, and synthesis, how we learn by hand, heart, and head, that learning is an immersive experience that involves all the senses. And in the room uh, just adjacent to me, the seating room, these window seats that get is initiated, giving the students an outlook um, over Greyfriars Kirkyard and beyond to the Pentland Hills. So this idea of an outlook, which I mentioned right at the top of the presentation, you know, it's echoing through uh, Geddes' projects. And Geddes is involved in, in other opening out projects um, um, in the old town. So in Wardrops Court, which is immediately opposite us um, on the lawn market, you can see how he, he demolished tenements that would have been crisscrossing the courtyard. You know, this would have been a real warren of narrow, dirty closes. And he takes them away and, 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 and creates this large courtyard, one of the biggest in the, in the old town. But he retains one of the key 17th century properties, uh, Lady Stairs House, which you can just see in the second image there. He persuades the Earl of Rosebery at the time to take on the renovation of this property and once it's done, Rosebery gifts it back to the city and it becomes a museum. So there's this idea of putting these kind of civic spaces in the old town for people to enjoy. And it's still a museum today. It's owned by the City of Edinburgh Council and it's the Writers Museum with the, uh, the, the Macca's uh, kind of courtyard uh, celebrating all Scottish writers and poets. So now we turn to um, a fundamental aspect of Patrick Geddes' thinking, which is the regional survey. And here it is described again by Nora. She talks about how he um, translates neighborhood in terms of its natural features, its topography, geology, vegetation and cultivation, its industry and occupation, its past and present developments. So Geddes is always looking back at what happened before, but he's also looking at the natural environment to see how that feeds in to the city region. And during his own early education, uh, Patrick Geddes attended some lectures at the Sorbonne in Paris, and he came across the ideas of the French sociologist Frédéric Laplay, who taught that society was conditioned by geography and occupation. And Le Play had a, a, a mantra which was lieu, travail, famille, which means place, work, family. And Geddes appropriated this phrase as place, work, folk. And this was something that Geddes came back to in his projects again and again. And here we see a representation of the valley section, which is the city region. You can see uh, it's represented in this beautiful stained glass window, which we have here at Riddles Court. And it's a visual example showing the mountains and the, the town in the center and leading down to the coast. And what you can't see is the river. It's inferred, but it's not seen. The river will rise in the hills and will come out into the estuary, a bit like it does in Edinburgh. The Pentland Hills, the water of Leith, coming out into the Firth of Forth. You know, this could be Edinburgh, it could be Dundee, um, uh, near to where uh, uh, Geddes grew up. It could be anywhere in the world. And the, the, the Latin inscription underneath is alluding to this. It says this is a microcosm of nature. It is a seat of man, where man lives, sedes hominum. It is a drama in time, theatrium historiae. It is a future utopia. And basically, this is where Geddes' environmental message is coming through. He's saying, this is what we have to work with. This is what we have to look after. If we don't have this, what do we have? Now, there's a very significant purchase of a building in 1892. Geddes acquires the former Shorts Observatory, 
and creates the Outlook Tower, which is a museum come laboratory where visitors could interact with great displays showing the development of the city, showing cultural development through time. They can survey the region by going up, up, up to, the, to the top of the, the, the tower there and having an outlook over to the, the Pentland Hills and over to the, the Fife coastline beyond the, the Firth of Forth. And they can see artifacts and artworks which educated the visitors in uh, cultural and natural heritage and actually represented a call to action. What can you do for your town? How can you make a contribution? What can your civic action be? And the Outlook Tower had many roles. And one of them was um, a committee dedicated to surveying the town. This was the Open Spaces Committee. And here we can see um, a map of their um, activity from 1909, 1910. And it shows some of the open spaces that the committee identified as potential garden spaces, playgrounds, civic spaces that people could use and sit in. There were over 75 of these spaces identified. And it translates into action. So Nora Geddes herself becomes involved as a young woman in designing um, uh, schemes for the gardens of the old town. She, she, she trains as a landscape architect, and creates these beautiful watercolour designs. Here, one for the King's Wall Garden, which is just situated behind the grass market. And this picture of Patrick Geddes himself, this photograph, um, opening the Westport Garden in 1910. And all these dignitaries appear, all these kind of well-to-do people, the scouts, everybody gets involved. And the legacy is still there today because the Westport Garden um, at the end of the grass market, uh, known as a Geddes Garden, is still um, uh, maintained by a local uh, group of gardeners that live within the community. So Geddes' legacies have real purpose and resonance in Edinburgh today. And the Outlook Tower also had activities beyond the old town. So they had a, um, kind of trips uh, that people could go uh, on. So here you can see an itinerary for a trip uh, which takes people on a bus from Princess Street to Slateford or they go to, um, to Bilston, or they get the tram to Joppa and um, um, explore Musselburgh and Inveresk. So basically, people get the opportunity to go beyond the city's boundaries and look at the hinterland, the kind of uh, natural world beyond the city's boundaries. And here we have a very um, uh, forceful looking person. This is Mabel Barker, who was actually um, get it his goddaughter and she actually became a geographer but she was one of the people involved in the work of the Outlook Tower. She was often in there uh, busying herself with creating itineraries and leading people on tours and things like this. So Geddes was a real kind of force of nature and he inspired other people to follow his call. Now at the same time that as Geddes was growing the work of the Outlook Tower, he was also involved in yet another project, this time to create an academic and residential enclave which took the form of the arts and crafts inspired Ramsey Garden. And you, here you can see one of George Aitken's preliminary designs for Ramsey Garden. Um, uh, Geddes worked with Aitken and Sidney Mitchell, who created those facsimile models of the old town for that exhibition, and another architect, Stuart Henvis Kappa. The three of them were, 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 were kind of Geddes' core um, uh, assistance and help in, in creating these great built projects. And Ramsey Garden, in a way, represented the pinnacle of Geddes' ideas around social evolution. It was a place of learning, of art, and of culture. Um, Ramsey Garden was um, 
the scene of a series of fantastic feasts of learning known as the summer meetings. And here you can see a photograph of one from around 1895. And this is where students, educators and artists all came together to create an interdisciplinary program of events. And notice in the photograph how many women are pictured. These were pioneering times at the, the kind of fin de siècle, uh, where women were really getting involved and becoming agents of change in their own right. And Riddle's Court became a female hall of residence during the summer meetings over the 1890s. This is hugely pioneering to have a space where women can live together, learn together. And the old Edinburgh School of Art here pictured um, by this flyer um, involved um, artists and uh, uh, working as tutors. And it, it included the great Celtic revival artist, John Duncan, one of the masters of the, the fin de siècle arts and crafts and Celtic revival movement. He taught uh, workshops at Ramsey Garden and the Outlook Tower as part of the art school's um, uh, work to support the summer meetings. And in 1895-96, Geddes launched his publishing venture, The Evergreen, which was a series of four volumes inspired by the seasons and celebrating the talents of Scottish artists, poets and essayists. And here we see uh, a woodcut print from the awesome edition by Charles Hodge Mackey, The Body Banks of Forty. And Patrick Geddes also advised the kindergartens of the St. Saviour's movement on garden layout. He gave talks at fundraising events. This gave the slum children of the Canongate a basic education and Geddes was involved in, um, in that uh, project too. There were many, many civic events inspired by history and culture. They took place all over the old town and they involved all kinds of folk, including local school children. And in the first photograph, you can see all these barefoot children coming down from the Outlook Tower into the lawn market. And they're being led by this unusual central figure here with the big hat. And that is actually uh, Geddes' son, Alistair. And he's bagpiping the, the this entourage of, of local people, almost like a Pied Piper, you know, getting people involved. You can see somebody looking out of their window in the top of the, 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 the photograph. Geddes wanted to engage people in their local area. And in the next photograph, you can see the civic event at the King's Wall Garden, where, you know, children are dressed up in their cleanest smocks and their finest dresses. And they're showing all these guests and visitors what they've done, the planting that you can see at the side of the photograph, the flowers, and a grand piano in the corner, because actually you were going to have music, you were going to have dance, it was going to be a huge spectacle. And also those uh, very well-to-do looking people in their big hats and uh, nice furs were going to be uh, donating some money to the cause as well. So everywhere you go in the old town today, um, you can still see the legacies of Patrick Geddes initiatives. Um, and it includes these um, impressive dragons at the entrance to Wardrop's court. And the two dragons at the rear of the court entrance were carved by Patrick Geddes' younger son, Arthur. So I hope you've enjoyed this short talk into the activity of Patrick Geddes in Edinburgh's old town in the late 19th century. Um, I hope that you've learned something about him and I hope you've come to understand how this man created such wonderful legacies in Edinburgh's old town. He's a much kind of overlooked character and um, I, I, I hope you've enjoyed uh, learning about him today. And as I promised at the top of the presentation, here are those refurbished properties that um, the Scottish Historic Buildings Trust has been involved with over its 35 year history. And as I say, please visit the website, have a look at what we do. And if you think what we do is brilliant, and if you've enjoyed the talk today, please support us with a, a donation if you can. Thank you very much for listening.